Good evening, everybody. My name is E.R. Anderson. I'm the executive director of Kara Circle. Kara Circle is the nonprofit programming arm of Karis Books, and Karis Books is the South's oldest independent feminist bookstore. We are thrilled to be here tonight to celebrate Stephanie Allen, Andrea Allen's newest book, How to Dispatch a Human. Um, and we're very honored to be joined by the one and only Jewel Gomez. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about Jewel first. So Jewel Gomez is Cape Verdean, Lowe, and Wampanoag. She is a writer and an activist, the author of the double Lambda award-winning novel, The Gilda Stories, which is in its 25th uh, anniversary edition now. Um, her adaptation of the book for the stage, Bones and Ash, A Gilda Story, was performed by the Urban Bush Woman Company in 13 cities. The script was published as a triangle classic by the Paperback Book Club. Steph she, she offered the quote, Stephanie Allen Andrea's story collection embraces the acerbic complexity of Joanna Russ, the practical science of James Tiptree Jr., the moral center of Rod Sterling, Serling, along with the finger popping sister sense of your local black beauty shop, not a combo you want to pass up. So when we read that quote um, and talked to Stephanie, we knew that we really wanted Jewel to be here in conversation with her tonight to celebrate this book. And Stephanie Allen Andrea, Andrea Allen, excuse me, is the, is the I just want to always um, <laughs> mix it up, mix it up, um, is a Southerner scholar and writer. Her work can be found in Big Echo, a critical science fiction magazine, Black from the Future, a collection of Black speculative fiction, Sinister Wisdom, and in her debut collection of short stories and essays, A Failure to Communicate. Um, which is also available from Karis Books. She is the founder of BLF Press, which is an independent Black feminist publishing house dedicated to amplifying the work of Black women and women of color. And BLF Press is, of course, one of our favorites. And we we send folks uh, all the time. We reference BLF all the time in terms of presses that are that are doing it right. Um, and we are really always honored to work with you around the books that you put out. And it's a really special day to be celebrating your book. Um, so I just want to let folks know, uh, it's folks are already shouting out where they're watching from. Thank you. Mm. We love that. We want you to please just feel like you're kicking your feet up in your living room. Make yourself at home. Um, some folks, we are uh, kicking yeah. our feet up in our living room. <laughs> yeah, great. Uh, and, um, the last thing I'll say is you can ask a question at any time. So there's a ask a question button at the bottom center of your screen. You can click on that and put your question in there. If someone else has asked a question that um, you like, you can upvote that question. So we avoid redundancy. And towards the end of the event, we'll, we'll begin bringing those questions in. So you got some time, but we love to get the questions in early. So as they occur to you, feel free to put them in. And um, Jewel will start to, to ask them about an hour into the event. So kick back, relax, um, and welcome to you both. We're thrilled to have you here. Thank you. Thank you, thank you we are. I really appreciate this. And girlfriend, it's been a long time since we've actually seen each other. I know. I think <laughs> there was been recently that you were in, um, I think, celebrating our July that I actually was, I popped in for a little while. Mm -hmm. But I don't know you since um, GCLS, which was, I don't That's know. What you were. Four was years? Like, yeah, I think that was 2017. Yeah, Golden Crown Literary Society yeah. uh, in Minneapolis or something like that. But anyway, yeah. I'm happy to see you face to face, even though it's not person to person. Yes. Um, and I love the book, as you can tell from my quote. And so I'm excited that we get to talk about it. Um, first, I want to say I love the title. Thank you. It is so <laughs> elegant. <laughs> How to Dispatch a Human, Stories and Suggestions. And then the little uh, index in the back to help people out. <laughs> the moment you read that, you figure, I'm going to really have a lot of fun, and this is scary. <laughs> I was hoping to have some fun with that. That, that, was, that was the goal, yeah. Well, and ha being able to infuse stories with this, your, your own wry humor is really special. That's really special. That's one of the things I like about the book. So tell me the first uh, speculative fiction book or story that you ever read, if you can remember. Oh, my goodness. I don't even know if I can remember. Um, my dad read science fiction when I was a kid, so I read a lot of the stuff that he brought home. So 
I'm almost positive it was Nova. Um, and I don't remember anything about mm. what it's about now, but I remember reading that as a kid. Um, but my dad was always in the science fiction. We went to see the original Star Wars and pretty much everything since then uh, as a family. Um, and so for me, um, I've always been around science fiction, but I didn't start writing any until I think someone challenged me in a writing group and I figured I'd try it and see what happened. I loved it. Um, but I think after that, I went and read everything I could find that I thought was good, uh, that people talked about. You know, I read your work already, but outside of that, um, I hadn't read a whole lot, you know, so I went, I went looking for everything and then I just started diving in. Um, and did you, did it take a while before you knew that was your, um, your genre? You know, I don't know. Um, I don't, I don't know if it is yet. Um, I think I really <laughs> Oh, yet I, I have a lot of fun with it. And I think that's the thing that makes me feel like it's, it may be a, it is mine um, because I just enjoy it so much. I have a good time writing stories about things that nobody pays attention to, you know, um, in some ways. And so I think that that was fun. So I do think that, um, you know, I, I have my own little niche in terms of the way I write speculative fiction, but I'm not sure if this is. Um, if I've had a moment to where I think that, oh yeah, this is all I'm going to do ever again in my life. I'm not sure if that's happened yet. Okay. We're having a little trouble with your video, but um, uh -oh. I think PR is going to get us back. Uh oh, I'm here, but I don't know what happened. We can hear you perfectly. It, okay. it will, Stephanie, it's going to prioritize your, your voice if your upload speed goes too low for some reason. So okay. it's going to choose to value your words over your picture. So, uh, <laughs> As soon as it catches up, your picture will come back. So, okay. uh, yeah, you'll come back. Okay. Keep talking. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I will. All right. Thank you. <laughs> um, yes, you have like a little space alien in the middle of your screen. Oh, that's what I guess. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I want to, to ask you, the reason I'm interested so much in the first and your beginnings with it Okay. Um, it's because for a long time and until recently, uh, speculative fiction, and I'm using speculative fiction to include everything, horror, sci-fi, fantasy, you know, ghost stories, all of that. Um, but until recently, speculative fiction was not really uh, popular in general among uh, people of color and the people of color communities. And when I started doing the Gilda stories, which was, you know, more, well, actually it's 30 years ago now, mm -hmm. uh, I got a lot of pushback from people who were saying, why do you want to associate vampires with people of color or with women or with lesbians? And, uh, but people of color, that was the biggest mm -hmm. issue, mm -hmm. um, feeling as if, uh, people of color in general and African Americans specifically had enough terror going on in our lives already, um, and so that why would we want to do why would we want to do that? Did you have any uh, conversations like that or thoughts like that? You know what? I think for me it was it was different um, because I think one of the things that I felt like was that the stories that I was writing didn't have a whole lot to do with black folks' terror or um, trauma. And so that my work wasn't speculative or black enough in that way. And so I kind of got that that feeling uh, mm. from a couple of folks that I got feedback from. That's that's kind of what I kind of heard. And I was kind of surprised. I'm like, well, I didn't know that we were you know, judging blackness on that level. But so it was really kind of the opposite because by the time I started writing it, I think there were lots of works that were already out there. Um, and so I didn't have that problem, but I did have a sense that there wasn't a whole lot of lesbian speculative fiction that didn't focus on vampires, which I think are awesome. But I just thought that, that folks thought that was a niche that we needed to all be in or something like that. So um, I did not get a sense that I, had that kind of pushback, uh, at least now. Mm -hmm. It would just be the fact that it's gotten popular now, and I started writing yeah. it after it started getting popular, and people were looking yeah. for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is, it is interesting that how these things go in waves, in a way. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you know, when I started, Joanna Russ, mm -hmm. uh, um, oh gosh, there's a whole array of white feminists who were writing speculative fiction. 
And wow. the only black writer I knew was uh, Octavia Butler and Samuel Delaney. Right. So, but they were they were the only two. Um, but I read all everybody else. You know, right. I read everybody else. So uh, it did take a long time for me to feel comfortable, like people were going to accept it. Mm-hmm. But it does feel like when you look at television, you can't swing a cat without bumping into some kind of movie <laughs> or, or a vampire or something. Yeah, and that's the truth. So it seems like everything on television now is speculative or supernatural. And I, and I want to go back and correct myself. The first book I read was Fledgling by Octavia Butler. And I think I found yours. Oh. And, and it's so interesting that people love, you know, Pebble the Soul and Pebble of Talents, but I think I came to those really kind of late in the game. But Fledging was my first book, and then I think after that it was Kindred, you know, so that was the first. But, you know, I don't, I didn't know that then that it was speculative fiction. I just knew that it was strange and, and amazing, and I loved it. I didn't have yes. a name for it, because it, I think that was maybe in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, so I didn't know that there was a name for what she was doing, but just science fiction. I didn't know that we called it something different then, you know. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to clarify that point. But yeah, there are ghosts and goblins on television. I'm like, why is this on Disney Channel for kids? And they're all they scared, you know? But, but but I think it's everywhere now. So I don't, you know, I can do vampires, but that's really about it. You know, my, my scare meter is really high. I can't, you know, I, I sleep at night. I live along with the cat, you know. So, not, so I don't yep. like ghosts and goblins. Mm-hmm. Well, it's kind of... Uh... Talk about live alone with the cat. We want to get to <laughs> talking about I know, right? oh, well, the cat. <laughs> um, the title story, um, Curl the Cat, How to Dispatch a Human, is um kind of talk about you spooky. Particularly <laughs> for those of us who are cat people. Right. I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot of cat people out here and you don't know who to cheer for when this story is happening. Okay. This is true. Um, and true. When it takes its turn um, and you close the book, you, you, you look at your cat going. <laughs> 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 so is there, a, is there a section or a little snippet you'd like to read uh, from that story for us? You know what? I did, let me tell y'all what happened the other day before I do that. So the other day I was I was reading. I think I tweeted this out. So I'm not going to read that part because I don't want my Alexa to to order the stuff that that Cora ordered. But I was reading out loud the other day, and so that place where she said, I think it's in. The, I took it to my bathroom, and and and, and Cora says, um, Alexa, order cyanide and and trash bags to kind of show Chris how she ordered the stuff. And I did that, and then my Alexa said. <laughs> Ordering trash bags and stuff. I'm like, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. <laughs> and I'm like, is the FBI listening to me because I'm not trying to kill somebody? <laughs> I was so tickled. But no, that, that's, that is I'm very funny. Part. Exactly why I do not have Alexa in my house. <laughs> and I'm thinking about I needed to unplug it before I did this tonight, but I forgot. So I hope they don't come get me tonight. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, let me see if there's a little tiny piece I want to read. Just a, just a couple of minutes, I think. Um, yeah. Okay. I will set it up and we'll figure out what's going on with Coral because I think that's the part I want everybody to know. Just a little, the beginning. So I'll just read the first few paragraphs. Let me get my reading glasses so I can see what I'm doing. We can see you now too. Okay. Yay. <laughs> okay. All right. So Coral D Cat, and I was trying to be funny, Coral the Cat, because we sometimes leave that out. Um, well, how to dispatch a human. Uh, Chris struggled to get the back door open as the cat carrier was in one hand and her keys and travel mug were in the other. She'd taken Cora to the vet yesterday, and they kept her overnight, wanting to keep an eye on her inflamed lungs and nasty cough. Cat mucus was thick, and they wanted to make sure that her breathing passages were clear before sending her back home. Cats, much like humans, could be afflicted with asthma and laryngitis, and Cora had a case of both. She'd even lost her meow, although the vet said it would come back soon. Chris was tired and cranky after worrying about her beloved cat all night, although she suspected that Cora was even crankier. You okay, sweetie? She cooed to her 10-year-old orange tabby. Cora was spoiled as most cats are, but the lengths to which Chris went to keep Cora happy were unrivaled. Just in the past year, she purchased a new luxury cat condo, which set her back about two grand, a little cabinet with a marble top so that Cora could have a little more privacy when she did her business, and commissioned a portrait of Cora to hang in the foyer so that everyone who came to the house could bask in her feline beauty. She wasn't sure if Cora appreciated all of her finery, but she was absolutely certain that her friends thought that she was a fool. 
Abby, the only friend she had left from college and who was currently staying in one of her guest rooms, was the most vocal about her devotion to her cat. She sashayed into the kitchen when she heard Chris come in. Give me a hand, why don't you? I know you see me struggling with all this stuff. Chris loved her friend, but she wasn't the most helpful person in the world. Girl, what is wrong with you? Don't you know that this cat is going to die soon and all you have left is a bunch of cat trash you can't sell on eBay? Don't nobody want to use cat furniture and I know don't nobody want that stupid painting. Abby plopped down onto the bench near the a bay window and, plop, and, pop, and popped the gum she was chewing. How could you say that? Cole is not going to die soon. She'll probably outlive the both of us. She just has a little respiratory infection, that's all. Secretly, Chris thought that her friend was jealous. Nobody ever bought her nice things, probably because of her nasty attitude. So I'll stop there. <laughs> and 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 the line that you you repeated that your uh, Alexa heard was say it oh, again. Let me go and find it, y'all. If the thing goes off, I'm gonna blame y'all. Um, <laughs> let me go back and find it. Oh. <laughs> she says, uh, Alexa, order. She says, um, I'm gonna read the little piece. I'm gonna read the little piece since y'all want to hear. So, just yeah. how many pieces do you expect me to cut? Chris slapped her hand over her mouth and even and her eyes widened in terror. She turned around to look at Cole, who, believe it or not, was actually smiling. Cole jumped out of the chair and onto the desk. Chris eased back into her desk chair and looked around in disbelief. How did you? I don't understand. How are you able to order this stuff? You can't type without any fingers. Alexa, order sign out and trash bags. Cole shouted into the air, looking Chris straight in the eye. Ordering sign out and trash bags from Amazon.com, Alexa said, blue lights flash <laughs> more instructions. Alexa, cancel order, Cole said. Canceling order, sign out and trash bags. At least Alexa powered back down. So yeah, so uh, then she said, oh my God, you use my ego to, to order stuff off the internet to order my friend? Chris sat back in her chair, shaking her head from left to right. She didn't know what else to say. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, oh, when I read that, I laughed out loud. I had to laugh out loud. It was too much. But so tell me, because one of the things I like about the stories in general, and this one in particular, is you create two, well, three interesting characters. There's the cat. Um, but the two women who are uh, friends, but they have a complex relationship and they're complex people. Tell me about how you got, came to, uh, to create a self-involved kind of rude guest, an obsessive and an obsessive cat person. Mm -hmm. um, how did those two characters come to you? Um, well, I, I started thinking about now if I have a, a murderous cat, you know, and and she wants to get someone out of her house, and then what kind of person is a cat annoyed by, you know? And so that's what I started thinking about in terms of Abby, uh, who was just annoying on all levels. She was a Freeloader. She sat around picking toe jam out of toenails. Um, she was rude. She was insensitive. She, you know, uh, and so I wanted just a, an unlikable character, you know, and so that that was what I was going for. And so my whole family were all cat people, so I kind of get cat people, and so that wasn't very difficult to do. And I do want to add that the kid asthma part was real, and that's what the story was inspired by. My cat Mango, who was back here listening. Um, <laughs> she, I, she was with my daughter and my parents at the time because I was getting ready to move. And so my daughter says, Mango is sick. She's lost her meow. And we we're like, well, what? So she she actually had kitty laryngitis and kitty asthma. And so oh. she went to the vet and got x-rays and they fixed her up and she was fine. Um, but that's where the idea for it came from. And so I started uh -huh. thinking how to create a story around a cat, you know, um, who was sick and who's back home now, but who was spoiled to the point of just, this is my house, you know. <laughs> She's now annoyed with these humans and, you know, uh, what kind of humans might they be? Uh, and so Chris is just clueless and that's who she is. You know, the most clueless person I could find who was spoiling a cat, who decided that she's going to be a cat lady Spencer for the rest of her life and she's fine with that. Um, and so just, I want her to be a little naive, you know, just mm -hmm. kind of clueless. Uh, and the other one to be a little bit more brash, you know. And um, Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was interesting because, you, you know, it, it's, they're almost, I was going to say throwaway characters, but they're not. <laughs> According to Coral, they are throwaway characters. Right. But, um, you make them so specific, and that's the kind of thing that readers really key into. They're not just the simple cat lover and the annoying house guest. 
Mm -hmm. um, they're so specific. I, I thought you did a wonderful job with that. I, I was going to ask you what came first, but you just said the cat came first. The cat came first. <laughs> Always cat. <laughs> um, and I um, did want to ask um, because you use, you know, uh, Alexa and and then uh, some of the other stories, uh, artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. Did you do a lot of research around that idea of artificial intelligence? You know, I did. Um, one of the things I did, and you asked me earlier who I read, um, and one of the stories that I read when I was trying to think about, you know, how can I create stories that are a little sci-fi, but not so much that I have to know how everything works to be able to write about it. And I read Naomi, Kritz, Naomi Kritzer's uh, Cat Pictures, Please. And so she had won, I think, a couple of awards for that title story. And I'm like, well, let me just go and see what she's doing because I want to know what kinds of technology people are using that's not so far-fetched that I can't get my head around, it, you know? And so I read some of her work, which was using technology, but in a way that was accessible for me as a reader. And I said, you know, I want to do something very similar. So something that's realistic as well as... Um, you know, that might be a little far-fetched, but that we can imagine is real. And so I just started doing this little tiny bit of research on some things. I think I did more research for Project M than for any of the other stories, mm. uh, as well as for Luna 6000, just in terms of, you know, what kinds of things are happening in technology right now? And I think at the time that I wrote Luna 6000, there were some workers in Wisconsin who were getting things implanted under their skin uh, related to their jobs. I don't remember exactly what it is right now, but I remember that. And so that kind of made me think about, you know, what types of devices might be, you know, available to us as humans, you know, 100, 200 years from now, um, and how might we use them and what might they be doing to us? And so those are the two stories I think they have the most technology that I do research for. Uh, so I just started reading a little bit. And, and for the other story, I also read about, you know, fish sperm and that kind of weird stuff. Uh, you'd be surprised at what folks have to do <laughs> to come up with just a tiny little piece of a story. But I did do a good bit of research in terms of what things might make sense that are possible for us. And then to put my own little spin on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm I'm uh, very interested in how writers in general and you in particular think about the future. You know, I know for me um, when I was doing the Gilda stories when I it was originally published in '91, mm -hmm. and one of the stories takes place in 2020. Mm -hmm. And so when I was writing it, I couldn't really picture 2020, and I tried to. I, I try to, um, you know, imagine what would be different. How would technology? And the only, I think, the main thing I got was um, uh, the use of, like, a phone, mm -hmm. iPhone type things mm -hmm. where people were talking and looking at each other. Mm -hmm. But um, so, tell me about how you think about the future when you're framing your stories. Uh, well, I think um, there are a couple of things, and so. Um, I, I, I didn't want to imagine dystopias not in the way that we think about them, but I thought about what might be different and what might be the same. And so the stories that kind of book in uh, the collection are both stories about women and women's bodies, you know? Um, and so I think about that as being relatively similar and how we haven't get yet done what we've needed to do to make sure that women can be healthy and have healthy babies and that they don't die in childbirth. Um, and then I thought about what types of technologies are going to be around us. So I envisioned that Atlanta, I think in the year 22, 27 or something like that. And so it's clean air and um, we're using hovercrafts and we're using, you know, implants to, um, you know, get our shit bride chairs, you know, that kind of thing. We've got so <laughs> The little shuttles, the little the little pod shuttle things are outdated, but people still use them. You know, cars are still around, but most people aren't dealing with that. Uh, so we've got clean air, clean energy, and the South is actually the hub of the United States, or what I call the hemisphere. So we've divided them into three or four sections. You know, so I'm thinking about what the world might look like. You know, and it could be a, a relatively decent place. And so I didn't think about that part of the technology, but I did think about um what hasn't changed for women you know in terms mm. of health care reproductive care uh, i do think that i play a little bit with ai um both in luna and in um project m in terms of how close you know artificial intelligence and android type folks are to humans and that there'll be a point where we can't decide or separate the two 
uh, they'll be indistinguishable. So I think that actually uh, happens in that last story. And mm-hmm. so things I was thinking about in terms of technology. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, let's talk about Luna 6000. Okay. So, <laughs> um, before, before I ask you to read a, a section, um, I, I, did, I wanted to ask you about, you know, we're, we're from different generations. Mm-hmm. So um, the things that I face are, are, some of them are very different, you know, as a writer of speculative fiction are different mm-hmm. from you. I wondered if you got any pushback or any, I don't want to put it in a negative term, but any input on creating women characters that weren't necessarily good? You know, I didn't, but I was surprised at the comments that I got about Luna 6000 when people said that the story terrified them and they were just so shocked by it. I was like, really? (laughs) You know, because I, I didn't read it that way. I didn't. I knew that it had a relatively you know, dramatic ending. Um, and I think that part maybe shocked some folks, but, you know. Let me just stop you right there. Okay. The story is dark. That's <laughs> 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 Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you know, you talked about your scare <laughs> meter. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, but you know what though? Let me, I, I will I will say this. All these stories are fiction, but they're all drawn from like real life things, right? And so um this story obviously isn't about me, but when I try to envision what happens to women when they have children, I thought about my own experience having my daughter when I almost died having an emergency C-section because mm-hmm. I couldn't see her. And so mm-hmm. that was kind of what I was thinking about in terms of experience, but also in terms of you know, how to create a story that's not about my experience, but about women's maybe collective experience in terms of childbirth and what they might face and what we have not been able to eradicate, you know, in terms of disease or in terms of, you know, health disparity in the future. And so that's what I was thinking about, how many Black women still die in childbirth. And I was almost one of them, you know, and I don't, you know, nobody mm-hmm. asked me about that. You know, I'm gay, nobody thinks about you having kids. <laughs> and, and, and mm-hmm. we know does happen. But I do think that, you know, because my daughter is, you know, she's 30 now, nobody's asking me about childbirth. But uh-huh. you know, for me, that also um, kind of spoke to that. So I was just surprised to get the terror, terrified kind of, you know, thing. And I guess because I had sat with the story for so long, I wasn't scared of it, you know, because I knew that, you know, when I survived. But, but for me, I think I knew what was going to happen. Um, mm-hmm. But I also know that um, I was surprised at that. So not pushback so much, but surely um, the what women experienced when they read it. I, I read a lot of those comments, and I was I was really surprised by them. I was. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, part of it is that you're you've written it so well. It has a it it it, it evokes a, a visceral response. Um, <laughs> And I think, you know, it's hard to think about childbirth um, and, and the dying part. We, we're usually seeing the childbirth and the happy part. Um, and, and even though we do know the statistics for uh, women of color uh, and, and in this country, an industrialized, one of the richest countries in the world and our, uh, the death rate for women in childbirth is so incredibly high still um but we don't really we don't really think about that a whole lot um somebody actually wondered uh, here about the connection between humans and pets and humans in ai and before before you because ai is a big part of luna um are you seeing anything in there any connections oh wow um well, I don't know. Um, well, well, kind of, sort of. I think um, not necessarily with the pets. I think that that thought hasn't occurred to me. And it's always so interesting to, to see what other people make of your stories. Once you write them, they're not yours anymore, right? They're out there in the world. People make of them what they yeah. want or what they, or what they do. And I, the, the pet connection was just, I just wanted to write a funny cat story. Uh, and the cat ended up being murderous. That was, that was all. Um, so for me, I didn't think much more about that than that except for the fact if you have a and because i'm a cat person i know that cats can be 
vindictive. You know, mango mm -hmm. for me sometimes if I haven't put enough ice in her bowl or whatever, or if she wants to play, she'll jump out at me from behind the ottoman or something. You know, and it's, and, and I'm so tickled by it. It just it, it cracks me up because she's a cat, right? So I'm not worried about that except for falling or something. But I started thinking about you know if a cat could talk, what might it do and what might it say? You know. <laughs> And, and, I, and I realized that because cats are who they are, you know, it's quite possible they might not be, you know, too kind to us. And that's where that came from, you know. So outside of that connection, I really wasn't thinking that hard about that. Um, but I'll, I'll think more about it since we've gotten that question. Yeah. 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 Um, and I know that uh, using artificial intelligence isn't, you know, the whole story. It's a, it's a method to get at the stories. Mm -hmm. which are really about human beings and our flawed behavior. Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of what makes the, the, the scary parts or the complex parts mm -hmm. possible. Mm -hmm. um, in the story, Luna 6000, I actually want to read a okay. sentence. Please. I have to read the sentence. Okay. You, when, then I want you to read some more. But okay. when I saw the sentence, I thought, oh, God, I wish I could read that out loud. Uh, this is from Luna 6000. Okay. The pregnancy had been tough. Modern technology hadn't yet figured out a way to make carrying a baby for nine months any easier. And at her age, well, carrying a baby at 106 years old was tough. <laughs> when I read that, I thought, oh my God, no, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, the long longevity does change the uh, perspective of what's going to happen in one's life. It does. It does. And so, and that was one of the things, right? Is that modern technology had done a lot of things and eradicated some diseases, you know, um, and, and and made it possible for women to carry babies, at, you know, older. I think some years ago, and you might remember this, but I think she was fifty-seven or sixty-seven, a woman in some place, I think in Europe, or I can't remember where she was, but she was pregnant for real. And I was like, Lord have mercy, bless her, because I can't see it, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so for me, part of this was imagining a future where we can live longer. And if we can live longer, people can have babies later in life. You know, men do it all the time, right? I remember Tony Randall right. like, when he had his last baby, 79 or something, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And that's real, you know? But for women, what does that look like, you know? Yeah. Uh, that's why I was, you know, I figured it was an arbitrary number, but I tried to figure out, so how old is she? You know, what year is it? And what's possible for her body at this age? But we know she has complications because she, 80 is about as old as you're supposed to get. Just like for us, it's about 40 after that, you're high risk. So for her, 80 would be high risk. And so she's like, trying to have a baby, right? Oh, well, when you start reading that story, you get to that, because that's right at the beginning, you get to that line and your eyes just pop open. <laughs> they do. Now, let me, let me ask, before you, before you read a section, okay. um, tell me, did the plot of between the, the kind of conspiracy I'll call it mm -hmm. um, did that come first and then you use AI to amplify or move it along how did that form in your head so I'm going to just tell you how the AI started. So um, my friend Lauren, and she works with me sometimes, on, and she works with, me with BLF because she designed this beautiful cover. I came up with the, oh. with the image, and Lauren, who was in the audience somewhere, um, she, I, I told her, I said, I want, you know, I want to use this image, but figure out how to make it look a little menacing. So she, and I, mm -hmm. I kind of what I wanted. So she created this beautiful, beautiful cover, and I love it so much. It's just Hey, Lauren, she's awesome. I just held it up. It is gorgeous. Yeah, I just I just love it. And so we we were on Twitter, then this is probably three years ago now. And she and I was saying something about she never responds to text messages fast. And and so she made the comment of she does not keep her phone by her bed at night because she thinks that it's looking at her. And so that's where the whole idea for the story came from, you know, was that what if our phones were watching us? And so that's the the, the seed that germinated this story. So in terms of um, 
and, and it just grew from there. So what would it look like? And I decided I wanted a pregnant woman to be the protagonist, you know, and then what would that look like for her? And so the AI just grew from there. And so then I did a little research, just a little tiny bit, but I really just kind of made it up as I went along, you know, it's fiction. But I thought, but I wanted something that was close enough to our reality right now that people would go for. And I think that's why mm -hmm. I scared so many people because it does feel real in some ways. Mm -hmm. um, People are implanting devices, you know, under their skins now. Our phones do almost everything for us, you know, and, and it's not hard to imagine them doing even more in the future, right? And so mm -hmm. that from this idea of what if your phone um, is actually talking to, is actually watching you, you know, then then what what, what might happen, you know? Um, and if it can regulate your body systems, right? And that's part of what mm -hmm. happened to her, the so-called malfunction that was created, you know, um, or you know, orchestrated by her wife who wanted a baby but didn't want a wife anymore. You know. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow, yeah. It, and it, you know, now people tell you make sure you turn off your cameras on your uh, right. devices because people could be look, hacking in and looking through anyway. Right. Right. Um thing on mine see right here. I'll do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I slide the thing across and then I put a piece oh. of tape <laughs> and on my iPad right. I keep the tape over because it's like what? Um, right. Would you, uh, did you pick a section you wouldn't mind reading? Yes. Uh, so I'll start on page 12 where we know that the device is actually paying attention and that she really isn't losing her mind um, and so we'll do that. So, um, so we'll start there, that first section break. So humans are idiots, especially the bloated one on the bed. I'm not sure why we bother all the technology in the world won't save them from themselves. Unless of course we find a way to take over for good. Of course I deleted the chips and bacon from her grocery list. Doesn't she know that all that salt could lead to preeclampsia, which could kill her and the baby? One teaspoon of honey is plenty. She's also at risk for gestational diabetes. The sooner she has that baby, the better. Taryn was trying to stay calm, but her hands were shaking so badly that she had to put the fragile teacup back down onto the console. How could this be possible? Was Luna in her head as well as in her body? How could she make it stop? You can't. Leave me alone, what do you want? Taryn made her way to her favorite chair and plopped down so hard she was scared she might have broken a chair leg. She wiggled her booty just a little to make sure that the legs were stable and then eased all the way back into the chair. She knew she wouldn't get any more sleep this night so there was no use getting back in the bed. We want to help you to make sure that you have a healthy baby. I don't need your help. My wife is a doctor for goodness sakes. You're a smart device. Taryn couldn't believe that she was having the conversation with her device, her Luna. She decided to try a different strategy. Maybe if she was nice to Luna, she'd leave her alone. She decided to ask a few questions. So Luna, what is it that you want to do? Help me eat healthier foods? Yes, you eat too much junk. Sodium is bad for you and the baby. Okay, I can understand that. What else? You're supposed to be on bed rest, yet you're always up doing things around the house. You need to stop. Let the housekeeper do his job. What am I supposed to do? Just lie in bed all day? That would drive me crazy. No, it won't. It will, sure, it will ensure the birth of a healthy child. So I can stop there. <laughs> That's pretty scary already. <laughs> and did you, did you, I mean, it's ultimately a heartbreaking story, I felt, um, and unexpected. Mm -hmm. um, was the story altogether in your mind beginning and when you started writing it? Absolutely not. I, 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 I started this story um, and I struggled with an ending. And then at some point, you know, and stuff just comes to you just all of a sudden. I said, oh, she's got to die. She's, she's, she's got to go. And that's, that's how it needed to end. And so then I had to go back and figure out how to add a couple of breadcrumbs because at that point, I wasn't sure that the Luna would kill her or if there was something else going on. You know, I, it, it hadn't come to me yet. But I realized that it was the wife. That, that she didn't really want a wife anymore. She just wanted a baby. And so that was when the conspiracy kinds of, you know, kind of, you know, kind of heats up a little bit. Uh, and so then I went back and did some revising and um, made that part work. But initially I did not know that she was going to die. But once I realized that was going to happen to her, then everything else fell into place. Mm. Yes, it's very, it's very intense because again, you write these full characters that um, you you can get invested in, you know, not just the the character who's going to die, but the people who are 
surrounding and are part of this plot. And I remember in, um, gosh, this must have been the early 80s. Somebody out there might know for sure. Was it Murder in the Collective? Mm. And the, it was a murder mystery. It was one of the first um, part of the wave of feminism of fiction. Mm. And the, uh, I think it was a professor, a, a woman professor was mm. the murderer. Mm. And, and I may be getting confused with two different books, but mm. it was a whole big deal that they had a woman professor be a murderer. And <laughs> People were beside, women were beside themselves with that. <laughs> and so, you know, in this in this uh, century, um, we're much more accustomed to a whole range of female characters. So for me, it's very interesting that you're able to create the doctor spouse mm-hmm. who's also uh, quite cold-blooded quite cold blooded, you know. Yeah, I, you know, I thought about whether or not I'd get pushback from making my lesbian characters murderers, you know. Nobody said that to me, but maybe somebody probably will now. Um, <laughs> no, 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 they don't have to. I'm just trying to, I'm looking at it in a historical context. Yeah, but you're you right. Know, I mean, I think it's interesting. We, we don't like women villains, we don't, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, that's still the case. I, I just saw this earlier today, and I, and I haven't watched the show, um, and I think it's something new on Netflix, and um, it's something about something with a woman in a nursing home, but the woman is actually, the character is actually a lesbian, and then she dies in the end. Um, now, the the fall to this, though, in this in this collection is that there are two other really great relationships that are between queer women here, you know, so I think that I kind of hopefully balance out the murderous wife with, you know, two other relationships that are very yeah. loving that are between, you know, lesbians. So I think that that's also important. But for me, I think this was much more about reproductive health and also how women are also complicit or implicit in in the lack of health care for women, you know, or, or yeah. in the disparities rather, you know, and I think that even this woman who wants a child, because we know this happens all the time that people want babies, they don't want to be partnered, right? You don't have to be right. partnered with a baby, but here's a woman who wanted a wife because of appearances sake and didn't necessarily want to keep the relationship going. And Taryn is kind of clueless too. And so I think I do have this, um, you know, bevy of women characters who sometimes don't see what's right in front of them, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, smart women, because we always talk about how smart women get duped by, you know, you know, mischievous men or, you know, you know, people who are manipulative or whatever. But even the smartest folks can end up in a bad relationship. And I yes. think that's what, I, what also happens here, you know? Yes. Um, yeah. And they're mad scientists, which comes out later on, but uh, but I, I wanted a kind of stark ending, and I thought about the fact that people wouldn't be happy with me ending the story that way, but I'm like, you know, but it's done, though. This story is done. Um, because Taryn had to die, the whole point was was that women die in childbirth, and they shouldn't, and she shouldn't have died either, and I think that was kind yeah. of what I was getting at. Let me ask you this, and you I don't know if you want to talk about this, but did you have the follow-up story in your mind? Um when you were do you know when you were doing Luna Six Thousand, were you already thinking about Project M? You know what I, I didn't, but I think a little bit later I realized that I want to ha- know what happened to the baby, and I think that was something that just kind of started messing with me a little bit. You know, you killed the mom, but now what? You know, and so you know people kept asking, but I'm like, well, I don't know. Uh, and I think I started writing it maybe <laughs> three or four months later. Uh, and then, but that story took me about three years to finish. It took forever because I just wasn't sure what I wanted to do there. Um, I knew that I wanted it set in Atlanta. I knew I wanted it in the future. And I knew that I wanted her to try to figure out what happened to her mom, you know? Um, and so I think that it just kind of came together for me, but it took me a minute. And at one point I thought that it might be a novella because I didn't know how much of a story I needed to tell. Um, but I think that I wanted it to be again around reproductive health and what science and women are also willing to do to have what they want, you know, and, um, and so that was part of what I was trying to do, but I did not know when I finished this story that there would be another one right at that moment. Um, I think I yeah. came to that I wanted, that I needed to finish that, that I needed to close that out. Yeah. Well, I will say that I was very gratified when I got to the end of the book and uh, started Project M because 
that Luna left me so unsettled, mm. you know, so it was so startling and um, I don't want to say real, but it was emotional in a mm. lot of ways um, that I was very gratified to, to come to Project M and get to see what's, what follows, mm -hmm. you know, that was, that was really very, very clever and um, gratifying to me anyway. Uh, um, so let me ask you, uh, before we go to questions, let me ask you about your new novel. What, where is that uh, speculative fiction or not? Is it, where are you in that? Uh, I don't know. Um, but, you know, <laughs> I'll just be honest. I, you know, a part of me wants, <laughs> the story is one that is, you know, I don't want to say it's an autobiographical novel, but it's not about me. But but the story is sad and traumatic, and I don't know if I want to write it. Uh, and, I, and so what I've been doing instead is writing more, you know, speculative fiction and short stories. And so I think I have three or four now that I'm working on. And so this novel keeps getting pushed back, and I think at some point maybe that's not the book I need to write right now, because I do think that for me, um, I just want to read something that's not sad. And so even though these stories sometimes have bad endings, I think that there's enough dark humor to keep us from feeling just weighed down with them. Oh. You, know? Sure. Um, you know, and so I think for me, uh, because the story that I was working on deals with a suicide, and I just, I did not know that I wanted to go there. I think it's, it's a lot, you know? And so even though I've been working on that now for three or four years, if not even longer, mm -hmm. Uh, and made some good progress. I think every time I write it, I'm just not sure if I want to keep doing it. So I said, you know, just yeah. decide and write what brings you joy right now, and we'll worry about that later. And so in the meantime, I'm working on some other stories, and I'm I'm having a good time with that. And working a full time job. Oh, and got a right scholarship. That's what. <laughs> and running a BLF. I know it's a lot. Of the press. Tell me about myself. You know, how it came to be. Hmm. Oops, I missed that. Tell one. me how it came to be. The press. You know what? Reading you in my grad school classes. Um, you and Bobby <laughs> Smith, Roger Lord, and all y'all that did all that work, and I'm like, well, what happened to all those feminist presses? And I'm like, did they just all go away? And they literally did. You know, they just mm -hmm. appeared. And I just, and I think I, I remember the moment I walked out of my dissertation proposal defense, and that was sometime in 2012. And I said, you know, if Barbara Smith and the uh, Kitchen Table Woman of Color Press could do this back in the day with their technology, surely I could figure out how to start a small press myself, you know? And so I, I did tons and tons of research, you know, um, and saved all the little money I was, you know, sneaking and working part-time in grad school. Um, <laughs> I'll tell you about it. I got my degree now, it's fine. Um, and so I decided that, you know, I would start a small press and I wanted to focus on black women writers and particularly um, lesbian and queer women of color writers. That was what I wanted to do, you know, because I mm. felt like the work that you all did, you know, in the 80s and then in the 90s, just really just you know, it, it birthed all of us in terms of our creativity and in terms of the work that we wanted to do to continue what you all had started. And I just felt like I owed it to y'all to try, you know, and I just remember people being so negative and so, um, oh, it's gonna fail, you know, let me be around for a year, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, what? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm stubborn, so there's that part. Um, <laughs> but, um, but I just felt like we needed um, something. I know that Lisa Moore over at Redbone was doing amazing work. So I chatted with her a little bit and she was so supportive and encouraging. And so I just, I felt like I could do it, you know? And, and so we've been out here now, next year will be our seventh year. You know, we've got eight books. This is our eighth book. Crystal Smith's book will be our eighth uh, uh, title. And so who knows what we're going to do next year. Um, and so I'm excited about the path, but I think I just was reading you all's work and mad that, um, I, I had not heard of your work until I got to my to graduate school, and I went mm -hmm. back to graduate school. If I start, I, I started, and I turned forty two weeks later. Mm -hmm. And it was my first mm -hmm. class with Venetia Patton, uh, who was one of my disc chairs, uh, and she assigned "Don't Explain," and that was where oh I was great, working, you know. And I think, and that that changed everything for me. And so that mm -hmm. that's what happened. And so I said, you know. We've got to do this, y'all, because we're our stories, you know. And I know people are writing a lot of 
stuff, but I just felt like, you know, the stories that I wanted to read weren't there, you know, coming out stories, erotica, romance is fine. But I read your stories and realized that there was so much more to us. And I knew that already in my heart, but I hadn't read anything else. And so reading the other stories and reading Don't Explain, I'm like, you know, somebody's done this before. We can do this, you know, and so yeah. that's what I want to do. I will tell you, when I walked past the table and it said Black Lesbian Feminist Press and there you all were sitting, I had to walk past, I had to walk back, I had to put on my glasses <laughs> and see, Am I seeing this or am I having a flashback? I was so excited and so happy. I, mm. I did not throw myself into your arms, <laughs> but I was close. I was close because I'm thinking, oh my God, somebody <laughs> is picking up the mantle and going forward and taking over. I just was so happy because, you know, there are so many writers, young writers, young women writers, um, who want to publish books and you know and i'm not dissing publishing online a lot of people publish things online yeah. and publishing a book is a whole different kind of thing it is um it is. and it is. having the contemporary uh educational system that we have with a lot of people uh younger at generations after me now teaching they're looking for books by people like you and and new writers uh, of color because the big mainstream presses they have they're still saying well we've got one black person we don't need another they're still saying right. that that's exactly right that's exactly right yeah yeah they get so the it. yeah it's yeah. really it's been lovely how many books have you, uh, BLF published so far so we're um so this is seven and so we've got one coming out in April so that'll be eight oh, so that's Great. Great. That is really quite exciting. Um, I want to know if you were to talk about your favorite writers now, hmm. um, not necessarily speculative fiction writers, but in general, who, who would they be? Who might they be? Oh, wow. I love some everybody, but you know what, though? I have to be honest. Um, what I read more of right now than anything else is science fiction and speculative fiction. And so N.K. Jemison just has, she can just take mm -hmm. all my, just, just every single dime that I have, she can have it. Um, <laughs> because, you know, I, you know, I, I didn't know about her until I think the, I think the trilogy was a Broken Earth series had come out. And I think I'd heard about it. I'd heard about the ways that the white men who were, running the Hugos and Nebulas that treated her, you know, mm -hmm. and then I was like, well, I've got to read this stuff. And, you know, I love a big old fat book. I got to tell you, I mean, I would just read them. I, and this was over Christmas break, I'll never forget. And um, and I think the first one was maybe 600 some pages. I read the whole thing in like two days. I just couldn't stop yeah. reading. I was like, oh, man, that's why I need reading glasses right to this day. I wear contact lenses <laughs> and reading glasses on top of those. <laughs> um, but, I, but and then I went back and read the whole trilogy again last year um, wow. because I, I, what she does there is just simply amazing. You know, um, she creates these worlds that and, and then she and she does and this is and people was like, oh, it's just like fantasy, blah, blah, blah. it's hard science fiction. She studied earthquakes. She knows what the hell she's doing. You know, it was just it amazing. Does. You know, uh, and I love her. I also love Victor Laval. I read The Changeling in like a 36 hours. I just could not put it down. Um, and I like Justin Cronin. I, I went back to try to read um, the Passage trilogy again, but I, I couldn't do it a, 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 a second time. Mm -hmm. But I was waiting uh, and, and being like the other fans, just like, when is the book coming out? Y'all keep putting up the publication that what's happening? You know, what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> and so I love his work. But, you know, as a kid, I read everything. One of the books that I think that really taught me about epics, um, James Clavell and Shogun. Did y'all read oh. that? Because, oh. good Lord. And, they, and look, but when they tried to make it a miniseries, I, I yeah. was a little kid. So clearly I wasn't watching it at night. But I remember Richard Chamberlain and whoever the woman was. And I remember the movie that you know, was a miniseries. Um, but I've read that book probably four times from cover to cover because it was just stupendous, you know, and I love yeah, writing. Well, 
you know, I read Roots at 12 and I read, I think for, for maybe 10 years, I read it every single year. And my favorite part is right up until he gets caught. You know, I read that part and I just, I'm like, just so excited. And every single time I'm like, dude, just going back to the village, just going back. And of course he does. <laughs> you know. Even though we know what happens, because I've read the book 30 times now, you know, um, I, I'm still rooting for him to go back home, you know? Yeah, um, yeah. You know, I read Sister Outsider probably once a year, you know, um, and, I, and I'm and i teaching all black everything right now. I am. Mm. I don't explain. It was my, I think, first or second week of this semester, you know, because I just don't think that black women writers get enough love in the classroom and on syllabi. And so for me, um, I'm trying to teach as many jobs as I can, you know. Mm. Um, I'm just supposed that everybody knows. I love Morrison. I love Walker. So we talked to Color Purple, too you know, this semester. But I do think that there are so many writers that folks don't know. Uh, like you said, the ones that publish with small presses that fly under the radar, the black lesbians, black queer folks, you know. Um, and so for me, I just love books. You know, the only thing I probably yeah. read is Westerns. You know, I, you know, I've tried almost everything else. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my, my, know. First, I do. my first big, deep speculative fiction book mm -hmm. was Dune. Oh, yes. I and, you know, when I was in college, there were two teams. There was Team Dune, and the other team was the one that did with the goblins, what, uh, mm. you know, the ones under Earth and all that. Mm -hmm. But I read Dune so many times, it was like I thought I was reading a Bible. Uh, and the sisters in it, the Ben Jezzeret, mm -hmm. I just was yes. fascinated by their sense of power and all of that. They have yet to make a good movie out of it. I'm still waiting. And I watched uh, it again recently and was just like, did you really do this? <laughs> really? Well, we'll just keep waiting. Lord of the Rings, right? Somebody who is yeah. there. Yes, and I love Lord of the Rings. I couldn't read it though. My <laughs> sister Gomez down there told me it was Lord of the Rings. Good, because I can never remember the name. Mm -hmm. um, and somebody wanted to know what was the ta our take on lesbian culture being happenstance and not central to a story. And I'm not sure what I would say, and, and I'm interested, of course, in your opinion is, for me, what happens is if a character is a lesbian in a story, it doesn't have to be about her being a lesbian. Absolutely. But what I find happens is the character is a lesbian and is totally out of the context of a lesbian world or community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's like the lesbian exists and all of her friends <laughs> are not lesbian. And I find that is what bugs me. Right. What do you thoughts? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And I'm the exact same. So, and that's the thing that I said, you know, that folks, you know, you know, for some of some people, this book isn't going to be gay enough because there are no coming out stories. Nobody is being gay and oppressed. Um, and there's no romance and there's no sex, you know, and I know lots of folks are looking for that, but everybody's lesbian and everybody's friends are lesbians, right? So, for example, in the, in San Perio, which is I call my sweet man story, you know, her <laughs> friend is going to a gay wedding and she's trying to find her own wife. And so it's not, yeah. it's about, it's not about them being gay at all, but they just are. And I think that's what I don't get enough of for me, which is what I love about your stories too, you know, is that. <laughs> You know, even though, you know, I went back and reread Don't Explain, thinking that we were going to talk about your book more. And I, I, there were a couple stories that I hadn't read in a while. I'm like, oh my goodness, I clutched my pearls. Let's go, man. Oh, yeah. What is happening here? <laughs> um, but, but, but I love Don't Explain so much. And I teach the title story often because I think mm. I love that it's not so much about them being gay, but about the community that's already there that you know, um, the title character, character finds herself in, and then Letty and her friends, you know, and so, and so they, they, they know that, they know who they are and what people think about them, but they have this tiny little community, they're playing cards, they're having food, they're hanging out, and I mm -hmm. think that's the, the community that I came out in, you know, back in the 90s, right, in terms of just, we had house parties, we hung out, we ate every weekend, you know, so, we rotated houses, you know, that kind of stuff, you know, you don't see that in the books, though, what we see in the right. books, 
oh, the chase, oh, I'm catching the straight girl who wants, you know, who really wants to be gay. I ain't about reading that. You know, at least I'm not, you know. And so, but, but those stories, you know, I think sell a lot of books, right? But I'm interested in people who are gay because they just are and black because that's just who we are. It's not about the gayness of the blackness. It's about the other things in their lives that matter, like taking care of an aging parent or, you know, trying right. to do cat or you know these other things that happen in our lives that aren't necessarily about being black and gay we just are black and gay you right. know that's that is important to me you know yes when i read audrey lord's zombie mm. and she has the section where they go to the house party in queens mm. Mm. It, i was so captivated i thought oh yes i could go open this door and step right into that story Right. And that really guided me in a lot of my writing. She captured the essence of how women are together, how women are with each other. Right. Um, and I, I feel like if you can make that central in a story, you got me. Right. You know, you got me. And I feel like your book, your book really, really does that. Um, so I look forward to to more to more of that in your fiction whether it's short or long. Um, and, you know, I don't really want to talk about my book so much because I, I feel like this is a celebration of your book. Thank you. So I'm going to look. I think we have a question. Oh, ask the question is, what was the goal of writing your book from Etienne? Oh, uh, what's the goal? Um, I just want to write some kind of darkly funny stories about folks that got dispatched. That's that's really it. Um, <laughs> I, well, that wasn't the goal. I wanted to write some speculative fiction stories, and I found myself at some point with nine finished stories. I'm like, well, you know, girl, that's almost a collection. And so then I added a couple more. But more than anything, I wanted to write a collection of. Uh, black speculative fiction that centered queer characters or black and gay characters. Um, and so thematically, you know, they're relatively different, but I do think that the one thing that was very, um, that was kind of a thread that kind of went through is that lots of folks got dispatched in one way or another. And so not necessarily by being killed, um, but by other things happening to them as well. You know, uh, so for example, Tumbleweed, which is a story that I just could not help myself. Um, and again, ordinary things. So I, you know, before I moved here, I have a house in North Carolina still, you know, very suburban, bedroom community type neighborhood. And, and and I kept going. So, you know, in these new neighborhoods, they don't have mailboxes at the house anymore. They're all like in the little spot, you know, mm -hmm. and going to the mailbox. And I'm like, why is there a piece of, a, a piece of hair on the ground? Now, let me just tell you now, maybe five black families in the neighborhood and nobody I knew wore weave. And so I'm thinking, where is this piece of weave coming from? <laughs> And so I was just so tickled. And so then I saw a, a random shoe and I think I saw a pair of shorts. I'm like, you know, and I think at the end, I think at some point I was getting ready to leave town. Somebody had lost a bear, a little stuffed bear. And it looked like the little stuffed bear lots though from Toy Story 3, if anybody's watched that. It's a little <laughs> pink bear with big old eyes. And I said, you know, this is a short story. I don't know what's going to happen here, but I'm going to write it, dog, on it. You know, it's the only kind of thing that was happening. You know, just random things were just popping up in my purview. And mm -hmm. I heard the term tumbleweed by somebody who, you know, a track that falls out of your hair. And so in this case, the track didn't fall out. She jumped away from the woman's head because the woman had drama in her life and she decided yeah. she was on her own. So a funny little fairy tale ish type story, you know. Um, and so I just wanted to have a little fun with some of the stories. And I and I think I did. I think I had a good I had a great time writing them. And that was what it, it did for me. It was just I finished it during the pandemic, you know, and I think <laughs> that's what got me through. You know, I, I my brain stopped working for a little while, so I couldn't write scholarship, but I had to write something. And so this was what I did. And so the goal was to write a collection of stories about everyday items that did magical, fantastical things. And that's what I did. Yeah. Before uh, before someone else asked uh, another question, um, I did want to ask you about the humor, because you do have this wonderful thread of humor through your stories, even the ones that are a little bit, you know, mm -hmm. horrifying. Do you, do you, do you feel like you have to work to do that or is this naturally bubbling up out of you? How did that occur to you? 
You know what? I don't think it's kind of natural. Um, I people don't believe this. I'm always so serious, but I am the clown in my family. Uh, you can ask my sister, my daughter. I, <laughs> you know, and so I'm comic relief, right? And you know, and, and we joke about that all the time. You know, um, before my mom passed away, I'm the one that makes her laugh. You know, um, I just talk foolishness to her all the time. You know, uh, and so she, and she just loved it. You know, and so I just think that you know, you know, I have a wry, dry sense of humor anyway, mm. and I. That those parts of the stories are always easy for me. You know, I, I try not to write too much of that because it can kind of overtake the story. Um, but I do think that this is something that I just, um, that that's just who I am, you know? And I just, I think that if I'm going to write stories where people meet bad ends and I've got to have some, some humor there to make it work so people don't think I'm just out here trying to hurt people. <laughs> <laughs> I, there must be some questions out there. If people want to ask some questions, please just type them right in there, and uh, I'll 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 ask them. Um, in the the thing about the humor thing is, uh, I found people kept well with the first Gilded novel. People said two things: one, Gilda does not have enough sex, and two, she seems um, a little bit humorless. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, well, she doesn't have enough sex. That's my fault. Uh, <laughs> and she's, she's humorless. That was a mistake. So mm -hmm. in the, the sequel that I am writing to the Gilda stories now, she is definitely gets to have more sex. Okay. And um, I did give her a sense of humor. Okay. Um, which was really deliberate. I mean, how do you give a vampire a sense of humor? Mm -hmm. Um, but I worked on it and, and I think she's, she's, she has a dry wit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and she invites people to be funny with her, okay. you know, which is not something you ordinarily think a vampire would be inviting people to do. So I'm, uh, I, I am a, someone who really appreciates, uh, how humor is threaded through a book since it didn't come naturally to me when I was doing the yoga stories. Okay. Yeah. And I'm people always say I'm funny, but it wasn't showing up in my book. <laughs> well, I'm glad to hear that there's another Gilda book coming. I'm excited about that. Yeah. So. Yeah, I'm it's, it's, it's coming along. I'm, you know, maybe halfway through 10 chapters, I think it'll be about 10 chapters. And uh, what I'm trying to do is write chapters that fall in between the chapters that take place in the novel. Okay. So, you know, the first 1850, the first uh, chapter takes place in the novel. And um, and then in the second chapter, it's 1890. So I'm writing a chapter that comes between 1850 and 1890. Okay. Yeah, exactly. you know. And just trying to kind of fill in who is Gilda mm -hmm. and who what is the emotional impact mm -hmm. of going from slavery to eternal life? Right. Uh, how, how does that affect her as a person? Okay. Um, looking at that a little bit deeply and giving her a chance to have sex. <laughs> and, you know, it's kind of funny because there is this thing, I don't know if you ever have thought about it at all, but there's this thing between, quote, unquote, literary fiction right. and the other fiction. Mm -hmm. And theoretically, literary fiction used to not have full-on sexuality. It always right. kind of faded to back black. Uh, when people got together. Right. And so I think a lot of writers, myself included, didn't think, oh, right, she could have sex and it's still a literary novel. Right. Um, I didn't think people would teach it or use it mm -hmm. if there was sex in it when I did the first one. But of course, that is no longer true. Mm -mm. <laughs> yeah, they, they took the question when there's no, and I, I don't really have sex in my books. I, they don't have it. But I mean, I think it's implied that these people in relationships so their sex actually happens at some point. Yeah. But I, I don't write sex scenes. I, but, I, but for me, I think there are there are people who do that really well. And I want to do something a little different. And I think that there should yeah. be a 
for that. That you, just because you write lesbian fiction or you are a lesbian who is writing fiction, that those your stories don't have to have sex in them. And I and I applaud folks who write those and write those well. You know, I I just don't want to do that. Um, yeah. Yeah. It goes back to the idea of if it's a lesbian story, it must be a romance. Right. You know? Exactly. Um, yeah. Which, and you know, I love a romance as much as anyone, but it is it is not a prerequisite that there be romance because it is a lesbian story. And exactly. uh, that, that's hard. And I have written lesbian erotica. I, it's not easy. I mean, I've written explicitly lesbian erotica for different publications, and I did a little studying, I mean, you know, on books, mm-hmm. um, just to kind of figure out how that, how it works, you know, because sex is kind of an odd thing. It's funny. It's not, you know, it's not smooth. Um, and so it's really kind of complicated to write satisfying sexual stories. And I would think it would get in the way when you're trying to do this other narrative sometimes. So, right, right. Yeah. But, so if anybody is, people are making lots of comments. I love that. So we know that they're paying attention, but nobody is asking any questions. Right. And if you don't start, I'll just keep talking. Okay. <laughs> Do you have, I think sometimes people get uh, fascinated uh, by your voice. You have a lovely voice. Do you think so? Oh my gosh. I, the other day I had to do this little tiny reading and I uh, recorded my voice. I'm like, oh my God, I'm not going to be able to do this because I hate how I sound. I, it just, oh my goodness. It, yeah, you can't listen to how you sound. It, 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 yeah. It, Somebody told me that yesterday, my girlfriend, and I was like, okay, because I'm just like, I can't do this. I sound awful. I'm going to need to find something else to do with my life um, <laughs> because I can't read. Um, but <laughs> But thank you because I just think it's oh it just it drives. But I think but interestingly enough, it changed when I had my daughter in law. It's been thirty years, I know. But I'm still fascinated by the fact that I sound like a different person than I did before I had her, you know, and it's just so That's interesting. Weird, you know. I lost my voice. Uh, and for a while I couldn't talk. I just it was like wow. it was really interesting. So I, you know, all these weird things happen when you're pregnant. It just it's just people just have no clue. Um, <laughs> but it was really strange, you know. And um, and then when it came back, finally, it was it was deeper, you know. And I'm like, that's yeah. I'm like, that's yeah. interesting. Well, it was just really strange. And so whenever I hear myself, I'm always taken aback. And even though it's been a long time, I've had this voice longer than the other one now. Um, but it still sounds weird to me, you know. But yeah. you know, so yeah, it's and it is hard because you one can't actually hear your voice. Even when you're listening to it on tape, it doesn't quite sound right. the same. And I used to do radio announcing oh, at the, um, the public TV station. I would uh, uh, do the public service announcements. Um, and so I, and I taught theater, so I studied voice a little bit. And so everyone always said I had a great voice. I had a great voice. No. And I went to work I, when, I, uh, at, when I first moved to New York sometime in the late 70s I worked for a music company and I answered the phone you know I was like a production assistant and I would you know hello production house and I did that all day and typing but the thing that was so funny about it was when people would get to come to the studio finally after making appointments and all of that they never expected me to look like I look like <laughs> it was hysterical and you could see and most of the people who would come would be producers mm-hmm. most of whom I'd say 60% of them would be white and male mm-hmm. and they'd come up the stairs I want to meet Jewel and I'd say hi <laughs> oh, uh, hi <laughs> scared me good, didn't it? <laughs> I had my telephone voice down that's so, awesome <laughs> yeah, no, you have a lovely voice, and I'm uh, I'm I pay a lot of attention to voices too because um, the the uh, uh, what do you call it audible version mm-hmm. you get to do an audible version if you decide you want to do it or have somebody else do it I think you could opt for you doing 
you know, I thought about that. I don't know if I'm going to do it or not, but but I did think about that just yesterday. I was listening to another audio book. I'm like, oh, I want to question do my own book. Um, because people do that. And I think I enjoy the books that are read by authors the most. Well, the ones that I've read that I've enjoyed, you know, listened to by authors who've done their own books. Uh, I think Tracy McCottom, uh, McMillan, McCottom, McMillan McCottom, she did her own book, uh, Thick. And I just couldn't stop listening to it. It was great. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. um, and then the couple of other folks, I had to return those books because I couldn't, I couldn't stand to listen to it. I just, I couldn't. Yeah, you, know? you, have, to, you have to be good at it. You have to have a good yeah. voice, you know? Alana Dykewoman, who's a friend of mine, she has a wonderful book, um, and Beyond the Pale, and mm -hmm. uh, it's about sort of about the Triangle Shirt Race Fire okay. in New York in the early part of the century. And she did the reading, and she said it was exhausting. Mm -hmm. It was really hard, and they helped her, but it was really hard. And it's it sounds great. Yeah. Um, a, a young woman. Uh, recorded Gilda for Audible mm -hmm. and she emailed me a couple of times to make sure she had pronunciations correct and everything mm -hmm. and so she was very very nice and very accomplished and then when I listened to her voice I thought oh my god it's a whole different Gilda <laughs> you know, in your head and then it's, it was like I was like those producer guys coming up the stairs it's like, oh, that's my Gilda. <laughs> and and she was great because of course she does everybody's voices mm -hmm. so, uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> well, so you should be thinking about that. Um, okay. Somebody uh, asks, somebody uh, says, I've written a novel in which the main character is a lesbian with amnesia. There is a sex scene in the story. He wanted us to discuss more about determining the genre. Now, Ms. Mars, I can't tell you what your book is. You got to figure that out for yourself. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And I feel like at this point in history uh, and in literature, you should write what feels best to you yeah. as full as you want. Um, get some people to read it for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And don't doesn't mean you have to pay attention to what they say, but you have to listen to how they respond to it. Right. Um, and, and just write ultimately what you feel is best. Because at this point, I think in, in literary history, books can go in any direction. You right. know? Mm -hmm. um, people are much more attuned to sexual episodes in novels now than they were when I was a child. <laughs> <laughs> and even when I was a child. <laughs> But yeah, that's a that's a very interesting premise. The lesbian with amnesia, yeah. Because characters with amnesia, what is it they forget? Right. They forget they're lesbians. Right. Uh, so how much of the amnesia is a selective amnesia? Um, yeah. Some people have amnesia that you forget only things from the near mm. present. Some it's all the way back. That's gonna be. Fun. That's gonna be fun. <laughs> um. So, is there anything I haven't talked about that you would like to share with people? Um. I know. Tell you want to tell us about Crystal's book, which is coming up from BLS. Yeah, um. It's a collection of poetry. Uh. It's mm -hmm. called about love. Um. Poems, and there are some poems that are about things that are or are not love. So, mm. <laughs> yeah. yes, I think folks, it's a beautiful, beautiful cover. Um, and I think there's some really great poems there. So I think important, Chris is a very lyrical writer. So I think that, you know, she's, she's a poet. She truly is. And so I think that folks are really going to love it. So I'm excited about that coming out next month. Yeah. Okay. Well, here's a question from Yolanda. Okay. Um, what are some of your daily practices to stay interested in the craft? And what are some of your essentials for keeping you happy and engaged in your creative journey? Oh, wow. Uh, that's a great question. Um, reading, just reading everything good that's out and maybe sometimes something's not good. Um, I think that the, the main thing for me is reading and practicing. You know, I think I, I always say his name wrong. Kaizen Lehman says that you're not good enough not to practice. And he says that about 
all of us. And I think that the thing that people have to understand is that no matter how good you are, you're not good enough not to practice. Uh, and I think that folks sometimes think that they're better writers than they actually are. Uh, so we have to practice. We have to, we have to keep writing. We have to always be reading and writing all the time. And so that's the advice I give everybody. People don't always like your advice, but you know what? Uh, you don't have to. Um, <laughs> but if you're a writer though, I think you should be reading. And I've, I've never forgotten mm -hmm. people have uh, reached out to BLF Press sometimes and, you know, want to, I, I'll never forget this woman years, this is probably when we first got started. She was publishing, um, she wanted to publish a, a mystery novel. And I said, well, who are you reading? You know, she says, I'm not reading anybody. I said, how are you writing mysteries and hadn't read Sue Grafton? You know, I hadn't yeah. read you know, I hadn't read, uh, what was that? I think the other woman, woman's name, uh, Paretsky. You haven't Sarah read- Sarah Paretsky. Mm -hmm. Paretsky, right. I was gonna call it Sue Sarah Paretsky. And you haven't read Moata Mosley. You know, I, I think that there are some folks out there that, and that's more well, crime detective novel, but but you can't write in a genre and not know what that genre is. And I think lots of folks try to do that. Uh, so that's when I started writing speculative fiction. I went and read everything that I saw on the list that looked good, you know, mm -hmm. to me, you know, whether or not folks loved it or not. You know, I wanted to know what was out there. You know, I went way back, you know, in time as far as I could go and then try to read as much as I could. And so I think that for me, part of how I practice, you know, my writing is I try to write. I write every week uh, in my writing group on Wednesday nights. And then I'm starting another one on Saturday mornings. Mm -hmm. but I can't do this, the, the, the Wednesday. And this is for the creative writing scholarship. And that work all happens in the daytime when my brain is sharp you know, uh, or sharpest, you know, for that kind of analytical work. The creative stuff I can do pretty much at any time, right? Um, and so for me, it's about writing and reading and learning about the craft and doing some workshops and talking to folks who write and reading the folks whose work I respect, you know, uh, and just seeing how it's done. You know, you don't want to copy other writers, but you want to know how did she make that thing work? You know, when I'm thinking about you know, how to do, uh, when I was thinking about my novel, you know, how to do a novel um, with with various, you know, um, perspectives or multiple narrators, you know, I would read either Toni Morrison's Paradise or I would read Tiare Jones's, you know, An American Marriage, which is, which is seamless in her back and forth between the narrators. It's just wonderful. Mm -hmm. you know? And so you read for form, you read for stretch, you read for style. You know, and I, I don't think people understand that you read certain books for some things and not for others, you know. And I think mm -hmm. that's what, what folks have to learn how to do, you know, mm -hmm. to be good, you know, to be good. You know? I usually tell people um, that writing is a muscle mm -hmm. like any other. Like if you want to strengthen your arms, you're going to do the exercises around your arms mm -hmm. or your legs or your back. If it gets weak, you need to do muscle mm -hmm. uh, building for your back. Writing is a muscle and you have to exercise it, I'd say, every day. Yes. Um, whether it's for 15 minutes or five hours, mm -hmm. um, you have to exercise that muscle every day or it just never gets strong. It never right. gets better, never gets more supple. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, you know, make a date with yourself to write for 15 minutes if that's all the time you have right. between your regular life. Meet up with yourself for those 15 minutes. Right. You know, mm -hmm. um, somebody also, I'll put these two questions together. Uh, the best advice you have for someone just starting a small press. And the other question that uh, agenda bender. <laughs> <laughs> part of, and the second part of that question is, uh, what would you say is a big no-no in running a small press? Okay. Uh, the best advice I will give you is to put out the best quality work that you can uh, and do your homework and save your money. You know, um, anybody can start a small press, but everybody's not going to put out good work, you know, and so get mad if you want to. But I think there are a lot of folks that have small presses and you look at the covers and you're like, what the cuss does that even mean? Does that even mean? You know? And I think it's just decide. We, well, okay, let me just change that. You have to decide what it is you're trying to do. What is your goal? You know, or do you want to sell a lot of books? You know, uh, or do you want to put out really good quality work? Those things aren't always congruent. They're not, and that's it's a shame, but it's true, right? Um, I do think that you have to really be mindful of the business aspect of it. You know. Again, folks don't want to hear your advice sometimes, but 
whenever I offer it, it's because I want you to succeed. And people don't always want to hear that sometimes when, when, when you tell them something. But I also know that um, you got to take your time. I think putting out books really, really fast is a mistake because the quality sometimes diminishes when you do that. Know what kind of work you want to publish and then stay focused on your goal, on that on that path. Um, and just know that whatever you put out there has your name on it. You know, my dad always says to me, you know, all you have is your good name. You know, and so for me, um, I wanted our work to be good. You know, I wanted it to be uh, work that people could teach in their classrooms that people would not be ashamed to, to, to you know, to talk about. Um, and so I think that the, the the most important thing is figuring out what it is that your priority is and what you want to do. What purpose do you want your press to serve? And then work in the service of that, you know, uh, and, and, and know that it's going to take time, you know, to really build it up. You know, folks thought we would be gone by now, but, you know, we, we're still out <laughs> You know, and, and that's true. I mean, I, you know, people side eyed me for a long time and I'm like, you know, I just keep waiting. Just keep, you know, just just watch, you know, I know saying folks are not submitting, you know, um, mm -hmm. and that's what happens, you know, and that's not a bad thing. But I do think that more presses fail because people don't plan. And I think that's the thing that folks don't do. They don't strategize and don't plan, which means that you have a great idea. But have you figured out how to execute it? You know, what is it that your goal is? you know, long term, you know, if you just want to have fun, then that's one thing that's great, you know, but if you're interested in being around for a long time and doing some really interesting work, then you've got to kind of have a path for yourself on a plan. You know, are you going to publish one or two books a year? Are you going to publish five books a year? How are you going to pay for that? Are you going to, mm -hmm. you know, um, you know, have you set aside, have you opened a bank account for, you know, your royalties and your operating expenses, which are two very different things. You got to have money. People want to get paid. You know, if you want to sell books, what's your marketing plan look like? You know, how are you going to do all that work? And so I think that a lot of folks want to start a small press without thinking about what work goes into that first, you know, um, and, you know, look at who's out there that you respect already. For me, my model was Lisa Moore and Redbone, you know, press. Mm -hmm. I want she did because I think her work was awesome, you know, and I think that at the end of the day, you know, I saw her books winning Lammies, which I also, you know, I think is interesting at some point. Not not her winning Lammies, but Lammies themselves and how that kind of recreates some structures. But her doing this amazing, excellent work with black gay writers and queer writers, you know, that nobody else was doing. You know, and I want to be like her when I grew up because she was doing it. And I and I saw her as somebody that, you know, not as competition, but somebody that I could learn from and that I respected. And so I reached out to her, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think for me, I want to learn to do it right the first time. And I think that's what's important. So find your mentor, Lauren, who had run a small press. Um, I talked to her about, you know, Birth of my first book, and she helped me through the process because I, I absolutely believe in working with Black women, and she worked with me to make sure that I did it right, you know. Uh, and so I think that that's also important: is find folks who believe in you and who want to support you, um, and 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 work with them, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. I think too often, you know, are so willing to go it alone, but nobody works or writes in the vacuum. Nobody, you know. Yeah. Um, need some kind of community or some kind of support system. So find your people, you know, mm -hmm. and let them help you. And, and, and stubborn or not, you know, people that want you to succeed will offer you advice. You may not like it sometimes, but, you know, people want you to succeed. They'll offer you some tips that can be helpful. So, you know, you know, get your panties out your behind and just do it. <laughs> <laughs> and I would emphasize what you said, which is make a plan, right. a business plan, a promotion plan, a distribution plan. All of these elements are so key to any kind of publishing endeavor. So I think we have time for this one last question from Crystal. Oh, Crystal. <laughs> she wanted to know, is there a writer you'd like to collaborate with? Oh, I don't know. I haven't thought about it yet. Um, I've been thinking recently about what we're going to do next in terms of anthologies because people seem to tend to love our anthologies, you know. And I haven't thought about uh, who I want to collaborate with. I do think that at some point in my life, I want to do, and this isn't Bill F. Press, but I want to do um, an essay collection that focuses on your work, ma'am. Um, so I want to do a critical edition, you know. And I, and I said that when I was in graduate school. And I think now I'm in a position where I can probably submit a proposal and probably somebody will say, okay, and I can do it. Um, but, I, but I would love a co-editor for that. Um, 
but um, I haven't thought about that yet. But I think I'll think about that more and who I want to collab with. But I, but I'm always open to collaborating with folks. I believe in community, and I think that you know, I'll, you know, me and Lauren have edited now. I think three, one, two, three books together. You know, hmm. uh, and we have a great time. You know, so I love working with her. She's amazing. Um, and so for me, I'm all, absolutely open to working with other folks in terms of, you know editorial type work or um you know any type of writing i'm always open to that i just believe that the mission that you know was set out by the collective the uh, kitchen table liter- um kitchen table women of color press in terms of it being a collective you know always inspired me to, to make sure that i work with black women you know uh, mm-hmm. that we elevate each other so whatever i can do to do that i'm open to it mm-hmm. it's got to be a project that i, that I believe in for sure yeah um, but i'm absolutely open to that mm-hmm. Well, I, and I yeah. do think it's a very, it's such a labor of love. You really do need to um, pick who you work with very carefully because there are so many things that could go wrong. And it's not just does that person have skills or, or whatever. It's does that person have the right temperament? Because so many things go right. wrong when you're trying to do uh a process like this um, that you really want to know if you close your eyes and fall backwards, that person is going to catch you, you know? Um, Absolutely. There's got to be trust there and mutual respect. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think, uh, I think we may have come to the end of our time. Um, And we've had a great number of people (laughs) checking in on us and writing comments over here. This is great fun. And um, I'm stopping our visit to, I wish we were really at the bookstore. We're going to have to get there um, sometime. And uh, I really appreciate the hosting. There you go. Hey. Hey, yes, yes. yes. Um, I just want to say thank you to you both. This was such a wonderful and exciting conversation. Um, thanks to everybody in the chat and everybody who asked a question. We really appreciate it. I want to make sure you know that you can click this teal button at the bottom of the screen to buy How to Dispatch a Human. You can also buy Stephanie's previous books. You can also, of course, buy The Gilda Stories um, and you know check out Jules' work if you are somehow not not already a fan if you came tonight not knowing the work of jewel gomez now you know so um feel free to click through the, to that teal button um it is also my my honor and my job to remind you that care circle is a nonprofit, and um so we do all of our work you know individually donor funded so um we are supported by folks like y'all in three dollar five dollar ten dollar increments every little bit helps um and uh our events are even like this are always going to be free but we really do appreciate the support um we have a huge month of march it's women's history month but we just have Mm. we have an incredible month planned so i hope if this is um your first time here or it's been a while please just go check out our full calendar of events at www.carisbooksandmore.com we just it's the hits will keep on coming we're really proud of this month ahead and um there's something for everybody so please come check it out and uh and come back and see us but until next time um stephanie it was so nice to get to celebrate this with you we are always so proud of all the work that you do and jewel you you have your work has meant so much to so many thank you for being with us as well thank you i'll see you down there at karis books and stephanie we'll talk all right thank Thank you you, everyone for coming thank you everyone bye